Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at the Royal Court DLC for Crusader Kings 3. Between the DLC and the free update, there are all sorts of crazy new shenanigans you can get up to, and it can all be a little overwhelming at first. There are choices that you won't even know you can make, and there are consequences that might not seem so obvious at first, but make a world of difference when you know they exist. To that end, this video aims to highlight some of the essentials in the Royal Court DLC and paired free update to make sure that you can make the most of it all. Now with no more time to waste, let's dive in. New Ways to Prepare Your Heir There's nothing quite like the shock of dying and having to take over as your heir. If you're lucky, you left behind a mountain of gold and a dungeon full of prisoners for them to execute to make sure people fall in line. If you thought ahead enough, you even landed them and gave them a chance to make a name for themselves, racking up some prestige at the cost of your control over them and at the risk of them, well, getting themselves killed or throwing any earned prestige out the window pointlessly. Either way, Prestige has always been a bit harder to control, though with some of the new options available to you, you can try and ensure your heir's prestige is at a decent level for when you need to take over as them. And these don't just apply to your heir, but to anybody in your realm, and in some cases, including your courtier and guests too. As a king or emperor with a royal court with a grandeur level of two or higher, you'll be able to bestow royal favors on any one of your vassals. This improves their opinion of you, and it also increases their prestige at a slow but steady rate. As you can guess, this applies to your own family too, and by extension, your heir. While the rate of prestige gain might seem slow, it does add up over time, and it can be the difference between slowing your role or being able to declare fresh wars without pause when your heir takes over. You can also assign this landed heir one of the many court positions that are open to vassals, master of the hunt, master of horse, and Royal Architect, for example, give the title holder 0.5 prestige per month each, and they don't need to reside at your court to take advantage of these boosts. And yes, to be clear, you can assign all three of these to the same person. I recommend setting a filter up with the name of your heir and checking which roles they might be able to take on, but be careful about giving an important position to an inept heir just for the prestige. What's more, the salary you pay is going directly into your heir's pocket, the power of nepotism on full display. On the flip side, if you don't want to give your heir a landed title for whatever reason, you can always keep them in your court and just make sure your court adds to their prestige. The easiest way to do this is, again, by assigning them many of the court titles that simply give prestige. That's pretty much all of them outside of the court jester. Keep in mind that here, too, you can assign multiple titles to the same person, and you can really stack that prestige gain, but you're also adding to the salaries you have to pay, and even though that money goes to your heir, it is coming out of your realm's coffers, so keep an eye out for money you might need for other tasks. And be wary about aptitude, too. You don't want an inept food taster, because then your heir might get themselves and you killed in an assassination attempt, so just be careful about the ineptitude, potentially, that your heir might introduce through nepotism. I mean, this all sounds way too realistic. Moving on, apart from these titles, you can invest in your court's fashion. At higher levels of fashion, apart from other benefits, you'll see courtier and guests will get a boost to their prestige. This applies to your family, children, and adults, just as it does to everybody else, but again, only to the people actually at your court. They cannot be landed, because that means they're not at your court. Perhaps the most wild step you can take to improve the prestige of your heir and actually anybody of your culture is to reform your culture entirely. The courtly ethos gives prestige benefits to characters of that culture, and so you can either modify your own culture or send your heir to be converted into that culture, like Sicilian or Catalan or French or whatever it might be. Alternatively, of course, your culture might just begin with the courtly ethos. On the topic of sending your kids away, though, is an important sidebar. Since courts are only available to kings and emperors and are only available to clan and feudal government types, there are a couple of workarounds you might need to employ as a lower rank individual or as a tribal government. When your heir reaches adulthood, you can still assign them some minor titles. Not all are available to lower ranked individuals or to tribal realms, but you still have some options and they still provide prestige to that character. Before they reach adulthood though, since you lack a royal court of your own, you can seek out a foreign royal court or your liege lord's royal court instead. 
make sure they have a respectable fashion sense before sending your child off to learn from them, and try not to send your kid to somebody you might end up at war with soon. One way or another, the prestige gain will help your heir maintain stride when they take over. As a tribal chief, they'll retain the strength of their armies. As a feudal or a clan leader, they'll retain their ability to declare wars and otherwise use that prestige for various decisions. Do not underestimate the value of these options. Do not underestimate the need for prestige. New Council Tasks As you may have noticed in our previous section, there are a few new council tasks available, and while some will rarely see use, others can be quite potent if used correctly. We talked briefly about bestow royal favors already, but real quick, it's available only to feudal and clan kings and emperors when their court grandeur level meets or passes too, and it helps increase your own prestige as well as a target vassal's prestige on a monthly basis while increasing their opinion of you at a slower but consistent rate. This is one of the new counselor tasks that'll likely see more use than not, as it pretty well guarantees improved relations with a specific vassal and it helps both parties improve prestige as well. Higher quality chancellors will work faster and will increase your own prestige gain as well as the amount of opinion increase per tick. And I feel like there's finally a reason to use your chancellor for something rather than set and forget their duty. Meanwhile, the marshal has received a bit of an overhaul across the board, pretty much. Organized army now improves garrison and levy size while buffing reinforcement rate, but it also reduces maintenance costs potentially quite significantly with a high skill level. Train Commanders now increases Knight Effectiveness and men at arms Damage and Toughness over time as well as potentially improving or finding new Knights and Commanders in your realm like it used to do. This is an option you'll want to use on the months leading up to a major war as the buffs to Knight Effectiveness and men at arms Damage and Toughness values are no joke. Knights especially can make or break a major battle. Manage Royal Guards, meanwhile, is only available as a feudal or clan king or emperor with a royal court at grandeur level 3 or higher, and it further increases the effectiveness of your knights while also making hostile schemes less likely to succeed. I don't think I need to repeat myself or clarify as to why both of those buffs are quite helpful and how you might want to use this task on the lead up to wars and when your life might be under threat. The steward is kept mostly the same as well, but they do have two new tasks available. Convince de jure territory is used to convince the ruler of a target county to hand that county over to its de jure liege. It's a very slow process and you can use it internally to have titles swap hands and you can use it externally to acquire territory for yourself under the right circumstances. Those circumstances are relatively rare and the process is very slow though, so I don't know how likely this is to see action. Promote Cultural Acceptance, meanwhile, is meant to have a foreign culture region as a target, and it works to improve the relationship between people of two different cultures, your own and theirs. This can be made more efficient through efficient interpreters under the new Customs Legacy chain, and it can help set your culture up for hybridization, as we'll discuss in a moment, and it can also help improve relations with foreign rulers by reducing the penalty from cultural friction, as we'll discuss right now. Cultural Acceptance With the rework of how cultures work in Crusader Kings 3, cultural acceptance adds a bit of depth to the love or hate between people of different cultures. When you select a culture to look at its details, at the top right corner, you'll see how the two cultures feel about each other. This is a two-way street. That is to say, the same number applies in both directions. It's not like the French can love Anglo-Saxons while Anglo-Saxons hate the French. They both either love each other or hate each other or somewhere in between, but the acceptance is equivalent in either direction. This number is impacted by a variety of factors. War between two cultures can cause significant damage to cultural acceptance, as can revoking titles from people of a culture, but giving titles to people of the culture or having people of the culture in a vassal-liege relationship will bolster it. Cultures that neighbor each other will see a boost to acceptance, and cultures that coexist in a realm will see a boost to cultural acceptance too. It's important to note that the more two cultures get along, the slower their relationship will improve. Cultural acceptance will always gravitate towards its baseline, and that's determined by a shared ethos, a shared heritage, a shared language, a shared religion, and a shared faith. 
the more the two cultures have in common, the more readily they might get along, and this might be a driving force in decisions you make when it comes time to change your culture, something we'll discuss more in a little bit. Cultural acceptance between two groups will determine how characters of those two groups get along. There is a direct impact on opinion, and as you'll quickly notice, a higher cultural acceptance isn't a matter of getting a positive modifier, but a matter of reducing a negative modifier. Knowing the language of this other culture will help reduce the negative too, and that's often a quicker way to improve relations with people of another culture. Rather than slowly improving cultural acceptance, you can learn their language instead and get along better as a result. It's not instant, of course, but it's quicker than trying to get an entire people to get along with another. This is a great way to keep vassals from being too upset at you, especially freshly conquered ones, and it also helps keep counties in check as public opinion is impacted by the cultural acceptance between the lord who holds the county and the county itself. Remember that your own culture doesn't matter here unless you control the county directly. It's the culture of the person who holds the title and that title's culture itself. The more these cultures get along, the less the impact to public opinion, and if they're the same culture, well, then cultural acceptance isn't a factor. This becomes a reason to give people of other cultures some land in your realm. Not only will it appease the locals, but it'll also help bring your and their culture closer together, and with shared ideas from the customs legacy chain, you'll even get a weak hook on such a vassal. Apart from managing interpersonal and public opinion, a high cultural acceptance is a prerequisite for hybridizing your culture with another, and that's only one of three ways to change your culture. Culture is mutable. Over generations and centuries, people adopt traditions of others, change their own to match evolving situations, or blend together with others slowly over time. All three of these are ways in which you'll see culture change in Crusader Kings 3 over time with the Royal Courts DLC. The option to reform a culture is only available to the culture head, and it is by far the slowest of options, but it allows you to change that culture for everybody of that culture. That is to say, if you were reforming a culture, everybody of that culture automatically follows the reformed version of the culture when the reformation is complete. You don't have to worry about vassals joining you in the new culture or not, and you don't have to worry about any newfound friction as a result. Your culture, the world over, is changing thanks to the whims of the culture head. Only one aspect can be reformed at a time, and you can change only ethos, martial pillars, and traditions, and it takes 30 years for a reformation to complete. The prestige cost of changing ethos is ridiculously high, and the prestige costs of various traditions are modified by geography, ethos, innovations, and political factors. You'll really need to set up for a reformation over the course of a long time. Now, another significantly cheaper option that'll always be available is cultural divergence, though not everybody of your culture follows you into said divergence. Your vassals may or may not join you, and so this leaves room for new sources of tension and friction within your realm. Other independent leaders will also see you as a separate culture, and though acceptance will start at 100%, it will deteriorate, causing friction between your new culture and the culture from which it came, as discussed in the previous section about cultural acceptance. Whether you're the culture head or not, you'll have the option to make an offshoot of your original culture and modify multiple aspects of it at once. A divergent culture can change its ethos from any one of the many options, and it can choose its language from any of the languages that the person leading the divergence speaks. So, if you're the one creating a divergent culture and you speak multiple languages, you can choose which language this divergent culture speaks. This can be particularly important as a king or emperor, as we'll discuss in a moment. Martial custom can be changed when diverging your culture as well, but your realm needs to have the appropriate gender laws before you can instigate that shift in your culture. A diverging culture can also replace traditions with new ones, with prestige costs modified by, again, geography, ethos, innovations, and political factors, but regardless of how much prestige you're willing to spend, you cannot add new traditions. Only swap out old ones. So if you had a culture with four traditions, you cannot add a fifth or a sixth. You can only swap out one of the existing four. A culture can only add traditions through reformation, as discussed earlier, 
or through hybridization. Hybridization has a few prerequisites and it involves blending two cultures together. For one, the target culture you're trying to hybridize with needs to exist in your realm in at least one county. Apart from that, cultural acceptance between the two needs to be passed a certain threshold. Typically that's 40%, but sometimes that can be modified based on cultural traditions. The tooltip will let you know what you need. You also cannot hybridize with a culture that shares your heritage. The hybrid culture is able to choose between various facets of the two source cultures that are joining. You can choose between your two ethos, your languages, and even your martial custom, regardless of realm laws. You can choose up to six traditions between the traditions of the two cultures, and you can even customize the resulting aesthetics. Hybridization will give your new culture 100% cultural acceptance with the two source cultures to start with, moving towards a baseline over time, but hybridization will also give you all the innovations of the other culture that you're hybridizing with. Not all your vassals might join you in these new hybrid ways though, so the same caveats as divergence apply here compared to reformation, but hybridization is the cheapest way in which to effect the greatest change to your culture. Divergence and hybridization also have the benefit of making you the culture head when the culture is first created, and that gives you the associated benefits and options like further reformations down the line, or picking fascinations. Language matters. Apart from simply being a fun new toy to play with, language introduces some interesting considerations in Crusader Kings 3. For one, as discussed earlier, knowing the language of another culture makes your personal relationship with people of that culture a bit smoother, significantly reducing the negative to opinion. This can help you get along with foreign rulers, vassals, and your liege alike. You can get a court tutor to help with learning a new language, they can also help children get better education traits, and they allow children to learn languages to set them up for future success. Children will speak the language of their culture when they come of age, but the Have Child Study Language action will let them learn the language of another member of your court. This is a great way to give them a head start on good relations with other cultures, whether they're vassals, their future liege, or rulers of foreign realms. This also sets them up for potential cultural divergences that you might want to do when they take over. Learning a new language as an adult is also an option. You just need to be able to target somebody with the language you want to learn, and you'll quickly be on your merry way. But it'll take time, and factors like your age and your learning will play into your chance of seeing success. The Customs Legacy has a few ways to help you learn languages, but you'll always have a maximum number of languages that you can learn, determined by your learning skill and perks. All this personal language stuff is well and good, and if you want your character to be a cunning linguist, you can, but the most important aspect of language outside of interpersonal relationships is to do with your court. Applicable only to kings and emperors, the language of your court will determine in part the overall grandeur of it. This means that you'll either want to adopt more prestigious and prevalent languages to gain said grandeur, or you'll want to make your own language more prestigious and prevalent instead. The amount of grandeur the court language adds to your court is determined by a few factors. The number of counties that speak your court language within your realm will play a major role here. The more counties that have a culture, any culture that speaks your court language, the more grandeur your court will gain from that language. Now to be clear, sometimes different cultures will speak the same language. So it's not a matter of having the same culture across the board. It's not a matter of how many counties have your culture, but about how many counties have a culture that speaks your court language. They're two different things here. This is, however, a good reason to either convert a county's culture after conquest if their culture doesn't speak your court language, or it might be a good reason to adopt a new court language if the math works out that way. As in, if the new language is more prevalent in your realm than the old one by a significant amount, you might be better off adopting this foreign language as your new court language and diverging your old culture to speak this language too after you learn it. If you share a court language with other courts of the world, you'll gain some grandeur as well. This modifier is inversely related to how grand your court is compared to other courts that have this same court language. That is to say, if yours is the most grand court speaking this court language, it'll get a minimal boost. If yours is the second most grand court speaking the language, it'll get a slightly higher boost, so on and so forth, where the least grand court speaking the language gets the biggest boost. The idea here is that 
the more insignificant court makes itself look that much more impressive by imitating some of the grandest courts out there. The bigger the difference in grandeur, the bigger the shared language modifier. As you can see, language can be a great way to quickly gain some grandeur, especially if you're a new or small court. Adopt a prestigious foreign language as a court language and make your court a little more interesting. Hire a linguist to teach you and your children the court language or spread the use of your own language through the adoption of your culture in your realm and maybe others will envy your people and start to adopt your court language instead. Something exotic. On the topic of adopting foreign things, you can and should sometimes take it a step further by introducing foreign elements to your court. This option is only available if your royal court has spacious lodgings and it requires you to have another kingdom or empire with a royal court within diplomatic range. It's an expensive endeavor, only available once a decade, but it's a great way to either earn prestige or increase your court's grandeur. You can choose to emulate a foreign court's architectural styles and if that foreign court is more grand than yours, you'll gain some grandeur for your own at the cost of your prestige. If that foreign court is less grand than yours, you'll sacrifice some grandeur but gain a significant amount of prestige. And whether you're mimicking a more or less grand court, the source of your inspiration will see an improved opinion of you too. An Adaptive Court Apart from simply exoticizing a hall every decade, there are some things you can do significantly more often to make sure your court adapts to evolving scenarios. Again, this only applies to clan or feudal kings and emperors, as they're the only ones that can have a royal court. Your culture's ethos will allow you to change the type of court you have, and you can change this on a whim as long as you have enough prestige. You can literally change it back and forth within a couple of seconds if you have enough prestige, so feel free to use this to your advantage as needed. Each of these options provide different buffs, as you can see, based on your current court grandeur and at times other modifiers, like your level of fame. But no matter what level of grandeur you're sitting at, sometimes switching your court from one type to another might be the prudent decision. We already discussed court language previously, and you can choose to change that from time to time, clicking here, and then choosing a viable option, spending the prestige for it. The amenities, though, are the next big element worth tweaking. Each of the four categories can be tweaked once every 12 months, and those tweaks are separate from each other. So, if you only change court fashion on one day, you can change any of the other amenities whenever you want, but court fashion will be locked in its new state until 12 months pass. They're all considered separate. Upgrading amenities will increase the cost of maintaining your court, but it'll also increase your court's baseline grandeur towards which your court will slowly make progress. Having any one of these amenities at a lower level will not cause any debuffs, so you might see an awkward event or two that reminds you of your less than stellar court, but you're not taking any penalties and you're actually saving some money. So with all that said, don't hesitate to adjust court amenities in times of desperation. Reducing the quality of lodgings or food during war can be the difference between staying afloat and seeing your coffers slowly drain. And it's only a matter of waiting 12 months before you can switch things back to pre-war settings. And there are many benefits that make the extra cost worth it. The health boost and increased stress reduction from feasts when you have exotic food is nothing to scoff at, and the prestige gain from good fashion is no joke either as we discussed earlier. Better lodgings can result in better artifacts being created by inspired individuals at your court, and more servants can help hurry your schemes along while preventing the success of those that target you and your guests in courtier, while also making it cheaper to recruit guests. None of these are essentials, which is why it's okay to tone things down if money gets tight, but the benefits are helpful when you can have them, and grandeur levels take time to reach or lose, so you can use that to time your changes. It's not like you suddenly lose the benefits of a more grand court when you reduce amenities. It can take years for the level to be lost, so even the more powerful grandeur level abilities and buffs can be retained without spending all that extra money trying to keep grandeur up. Again though, be wary of events that suddenly drop your grandeur and don't hesitate to use other methods to keep it up either. Artifacts Artifacts, regardless of how you spell the word, are a really cool new addition with Royal Court. 
I don't want to spoil some of the awesome stuff that you can end up with, so I'll keep my examples to a minimum, but keep in mind the variety of uses that artifacts have and how you can acquire them. Some can be worn on your body, others can be put on display at your court, and the remainder can be tucked away in storage, slowly deteriorating over time, or can be gifted to others to improve opinions. Some artifacts have prerequisites that give additional benefits if you meet them, while others are relatively universal through and through. Note that only characters with a court can actually use court artifacts, though you don't need to have a court to simply have a court artifact in your possession. And all characters, whether they have a court or not, can have and use inventory artifacts. You can see who has artifacts using the character finder, and you can investigate their inventory and court if you'd like to. If you're wondering why you might do this, it's because raids and post-siege looting can bring you those artifacts, and if you're planning on opening your own uh, history museum, you'll want to seek out these courts and characters to try and get the loot. Be warned though, there is no guarantee of getting an artifact during looting, and any artifacts that are acquired in this way will provide the target of such theft a casus belli to take the artifacts back, and will also allow them to scheme to steal them back, or even duel for them. But enough about theft. No matter your rank or government type, if you want artifacts to be made at home, you need to get an antiquarian first. The aptitude of an antiquarian is determined by a variety of factors, including their learning skill and their traits, like the shy trait can give a significant buff to an antiquarian's aptitude. This aptitude does not have an effect on artifact production though, just to be clear. It'll just help keep the artifacts safe during raids and sieges, and it'll slow down the rate of deterioration, reducing how often you might need to repair an artifact. The antiquarian is just there to allow you to commission artifacts, and to fund inspired characters who want to make specific artifacts or perform specific tasks themselves, like, say, go on an adventure. When you commission an artifact, you get some say over what gets made, but when you fund an inspiration, the end product is mostly reliant on the inspired character's desire, and if you want to fund them, and by how much. These inspired characters will have their own skill, separate from the antiquarian, and this is what will determine the quality of the end product. Well, this and how much money you end up investing, and how you tackle certain events that come up from time to time. Your spouse, for example, might offer unsolicited feedback that helps or hinders, and two inspired characters might compete for your adoration by going above and beyond. Whatever the cause might be, you'll find artifacts to use how you see fit at the end of the work. These artifacts can provide buffs to all manner of things, from better knight effectiveness and prowess to better piety gain and more besides. Artifacts are very helpful tools, and they do get passed on to your heir, but be warned, all children will have claims to artifacts that were passed on, and this can open up a few different cans of worms. Siblings might go to war for artifacts, or scheme to steal them, or even duel one another for them. It can be a source of great trouble. Don't let that stop you from acquiring and producing artifacts, though. Like I said, they can be extremely helpful and powerful tools for use on your body, in your courts, or as gifts. Now, about those inspired characters. Good artists borrow. Great patrons steal good artists for their own courts. Use the character finder to seek out inspired individuals and try to get them into your court. Abduct them and recruit them, marry them to your courtier, or otherwise pay to recruit them, like a regular person. Whether they're already working on an inspiration for somebody else or not, you can acquire these inspired characters for your court just as you would a capable knight, counselor, or trait donor. You can then fund their inspiration yourself and get the resulting artifacts for yourself too. You can see how competent the target is and make your decisions accordingly. You can also take a look at certain cultures in the hopes of getting better end results and borrow characters accordingly. The Gur people's sorceress metallurgy, for example, can make better weapons, so if you're looking to have a weapon made, maybe they're worth seeking out. There are many variables to keep in mind, but at the end of the day, if your court's just not fancy enough to attract high quality inspired characters, there are other ways to get them to come over. Customize your look. To wrap things up, why don't we take a look at a newly added feature available to everybody that could very easily slip under your radar if you didn't know where to look. Not a particularly crazy tip per se, and it won't help your game mechanically, 
but it can help you look cool while you're playing it. If you want to change any of the coat of arms in-game, it's as easy as opening up the relevant window and clicking the edit button next to the name. This goes for your dynasty, your house, or even one of the many titles in the world, as long as it belongs to you. You can't just rename a title that you don't have any control over, obviously. But you can zoom right into an individual castle or city that you hold, click the customize button, and have your fun. You can easily reset your coat of arms or whatever it is you're editing to what it was by default or what it should be historically, and you can also copy and paste designs to share with the world or bring them from one game to another. The level of customization is pretty wild, allowing you to go so far as to translate and scale and rotate items as you see fit, allowing quite a bit of flexibility as far as visuals are concerned. Like I said, this isn't going to give you an advantage on the battlefield or anything, but it's easily missed and it's a fun toy to play with, so I'd be remiss not to point it out. But there you have it folks, 10 essential tips for the Royal Court DLC and the free update coming with it. If you have any questions or any tips and thoughts of your own, feel free to drop them in the comments down below, and once again, don't hesitate to join our Discord linked in the description down below if you're looking for people to play Crusader Kings 3 and other strategy games with too. For more Crusader Kings and strategy gaming content in general, don't hesitate to subscribe, and as always, a Massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.